So, uh, praise God. Um, I'm talking to one or two people who said, how on earth are you going to get through all of the rest of the, uh, the nine uh, tools in the toolbox? <laughs> I'm not. Um, it's a bit, I, it's, I was thinking about it this morning as I was in my usual contemplatory place. And um, I was just saying, it's a bit like, you know, when you buy those cheese boards, isn't it? You know, and you've got all those different cheeses and which ones you're going to go for. Um, well, we're not going to get through all of them, but we're going to try and get through a couple more this morning, what I felt was important before us, before the Lord. So let's start in 1 Corinthians 12, which is where we started virtually every morning this week. And that is that first verse, and it says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. That is so important as we go from this place. We've heard so much. I don't know about you, but I'm already starting to feel full, you know. I know we've got to leave room, as we used to say, um, you know, you've got to leave room for the pudding. I'm one of these people who rather enjoy protein, but uh, always leave room for the pudding. But God does not want us to be ignorant about what he would have us do and what he would have us know. So let's turn to that passage in 1 Corinthians 12, and I'm going to read again from 1 Corinthians 12, 4 down to 11. And it says, Therefore... There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but the same God who works all in all. We've heard different people, different styles um, over, over the last few days. I was greatly blessed um, by Pearl's sharing last evening. A different style again, and when Greg shares with us later on, he'll bring a different style to us. But it's all as it says here, but it is the same God who works all in all. If we were all the same, wouldn't life be boring? You know, I mean, Nigel has his style, I have my style, Andrew has his style, but we're all seeking to bring God's people further on in him. And as we continue in read, it says, the manifestation of the Spirit is given each one for the profit of all, and that's going to be so important in the days that lie ahead. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to the other the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another healings by the same Spirit, and to another workings of miracles, to another prophecy, discernings of spirits, to another the different kinds of tongues, and to another interpretations of tongues. But to each one the same Spirit works all in all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. It is God who gives. It is God who allows us to move in those tools of the Holy Spirit as he wills. And it's important that we, we know what it is that God needs. What tool is it at a particular point in time that we actually need? So this morning I've just felt we would have a look at in a little way at prophecy. We've looked at the column and we're looking at number six which is prophecy, one of the vocal gifts. Um, what I primarily want to look at is not prophecy itself, but actually testing prophecy. That was what's real on my heart, but I need to um, just sort of put one or two things in place. So, as it says here, there's, there's a definition for prophecy, and it says the following. The prophecy is the supernatural utterance in the native tongue. It's the miracle of divine utterance not conceived by human thought or reasoning. It includes speaking for edification exhortation and comfort as we will have a look in 1 Corinthians 14 in a minute. But can I say we're also looking at those prophetic words that come in meetings, not just the sort of more formal acts of prophecy because it's very important that as the body of Christ we know how to judge what is brought so that A, the body feels safe and B, we can be safe ourselves. Can I say that in a meeting where there is judging of what is being brought, the enemy knows that he can't bring anything false because it'll be immediately jumped on. You know, many of us have been in wishy-washy, you know, you have somebody stands up in a meeting and brings this wishy-washy something word that everybody goes, yeah, it's brilliant, lovely, lovely, and you think, hmm didn't ring with me, how many of us have been in meetings like that, you know, um, okay, don't wait too hard. I will say, I have, and everybody's going, yeah, that's fabulous, and you're going, hang on a sec, 
we need to be able to judge it and if necessary give reason why it doesn't appear to relate and we talked about discernment didn't we that's so important we need to be able to discern not only what's going on but also the word that is being brought so let's turn as unusual for 1 Corinthians 14 this morning and it says the following in the first four verses it says pursue love and desire spiritual gifts note what comes first love that is primarily and if I if we were looking we look to 1 Corinthians 12 and we're coming to 1 Corinthians 14 and what's in the middle that big chapter about love often quoted at weddings but actually that's not really the context in which it was given it's all about church life it's very nice at a wedding to have that you know it's the one that everybody reads but we need to see it in the context and it says pursue love and desire spiritual gifts that has to be our heart we have to desire the things that God wants to equip us with especially that you may cut that you may prophesy for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God and no one understands him. We'll briefly mention tongues in public meeting, possibly at the end. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies, look what it says, does three things. Speak edification, exhortation and comfort to men. And he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. So if we bring a word, we are hoping, hopefully it's building up the church. And as I put here, edification builds up, exhortation stirs up, and hopefully there's some comfort in there to cheer us up. Very rarely does God bring a word that slaps us down, because that's not his purpose. God's purpose is not to put down his children. It might need, the word might be, there is this going on and you need to sort it out. And you might go, ouch. But that's not the purpose. God's purpose is what? It's to move us on in Him. Because hopefully when we get to glory, you know, we'll be able to say, good and faithful servants, enter into your rest. Isn't that what we desire? That when we go to heaven, it will be that which God says to us. So let's continue to look through on some one or two examples. And in Acts chapter 6, it, Acts chapter 2, it says the following. And this is what the prophet was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and on my maids, men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirits on those days, and they shall prophesy. Anybody excluded? Anybody not in those categories? Whether or not you consider yourself to be a young man, an old man, sons, daughters, I think we're all there, aren't we? So the Bible is saying we can move in the prophetic. And I would say one of the important things I learned as a young Christian was that, you know, we need to be secure that we can bring those words. If God moves on upon us by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can bring to... I can tell you to this day, I remember when I brought, my, brought that first word God laid on me in a church. In, the, in, in Wanstead in, in East London I remember I sat there and I went I think God's got something here how many of us feel that and you know as I said the heart goes doesn't it that's the first thing that starts to happen the heart goes from six to six you know, from 60 to 600 and then you sort of go oh, no no I really don't want to do this and would you tell you what well, I was told I was instructed I was in part of a young Christians group at that point in time and somebody said look if you feel God's moving on you to bring some word into the meeting say God make an opportunity so I'm sad there it was the middle of praise and worship we got all that in that to that church you had a book and you had all the pre pre OHPs and projectors and all the rest we had three books and depending upon which color the numbers were you knew which book it was in anybody remember those days you know redemption hymnal plus the purple book the green book and the orange book and you had little coded numbers and I thought, yeah, 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 we've got a great long list. I'm, and I said, Lord, give me a space. And the musician stopped and said, I think there's a word in the meeting. And I thought, that's me. And I brought it. And I'll be honest, 
At the end of the meeting, I was sitting there thinking, was that right? Was that not right? I can't, to be honest, I can't remember, but I remember what happened. And I remember one of the elders came up to me and said, well done that you moved in the Holy Spirit. Keep going. And really, really encouraged me in the things of the Lord. And then the dear brother, Johnny Barr, came up to me. with it. He had this massive mug of tea. I remember in the meetings. He always had this super-duper mug. Because if you remember, he wasn't a smallish chap, was he? And he had his massive mug, and he came up to me and said, Brother, good and walked away. But as a young Christian, isn't that what I wanted to hear? And I knew I felt secure. I wasn't happy. I was hoping there wasn't going to be a meat and bones word. But did it matter? Because I moved out in the things of God, and I learned in that church so much in that, in that year that I was in that church about moving in the gifts of the Spirit. And can I tell you, it was none of the flaky stuff. But you see, there we saw anybody could bring a word because they knew full well that there was sufficient in the body to actually judge it. And nobody felt afraid. And God would not have us uh, be afraid. And in, uh, moving on in 1 Corinthians 14, if I zap it, there we go. It says, Therefore tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. God wants us to be those who move in on the, in him. And in Acts 19, look what it says there. It says, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. They spoke in tongues and prophesied. That must have been an amazing meeting, mustn't it? Oh, that we could get back to that. But you see, one of the things is that, of course, we need to have the Holy Spirit. Oh, we need to be overflowing with the Holy Spirit. Because I certainly do, because I know what happens, I leak. Sometimes I think I'm more like a calendar than I am by a sort of vessel with a small hole. Anybody else feel like that sometimes? You know, the world takes its effect. But in John 14, I mean, Jesus said, he said, I will pray to the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. Note, the world cannot receive the Holy Spirit because he neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells in you and will be in you. But the help of the Holy Spirit, verse 26, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring you to remembrance all the things that I have said to you. You know, we need to take the Holy Spirit with us wherever we go, the helper. How many of us take the Holy Spirit down the shopping aisles and into Asda? How many of us have prayed for a parking space? Yeah, honestly, we, we do, don't we? How many of us have got us provided a parking space? You know, but you see, that's because God cares, I believe. At the beginning of the day, we submit our day to God, if nothing else, and we say, Lord, you know, bring across my path the people you want to bring across my path. And sometimes the enemy brings people across my path who I don't wish to be across my path. But then let's then and say, okay, Lord, what, you know, what would you have happen? But you see, when we move down to 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 29, it says the following. It says, in a meeting, in the public meeting, let two or three prophets speak and let others say, yeah, great! You know, behind like a seal. No, it says, let the others judge. It says, but if anything is revealed by another who sits by, let the first keep silent. But for you all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and be encouraged. Isn't it a great encouragement when God brings a prophetic word and speaks to us through that? You see, true prophecy does not condemn. It says in Romans 8 verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ who do not walk according to the flesh. We've seen about the flesh. But according to the Spirit. You see, true prophecy lifts us up. If it's false prophecy, it will probably bring condemnation or confusion. And that's something that's important. You see, one of the things is that you, some of us may have had prophetic words in our lives. 
And it's interesting that um, Paul said to Timothy in Timothy 1, I think I must have been, oh, has that gone on? No, did it go on? Yes, it did. It says, I, I charge I commit you, to my son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made about you, and that by them you may wage a good welfare. And in 1 Timothy 4, 14, it says, Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which is given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. How many of us have ever had prophetic words spoken over our lives? How many of us have got them written down and pinned to the wall? And Helen's is smiling because she knows where they are on the wall in the study. And I can tell you to this day, one or two of them, very clearly, and it's interesting that when I have actually, I'll, I'll share one, one of them to you. God spoke a word over me by a gentleman by the name of Guy Dunning. Nobody will have ever heard of him. He came to our church and he gave the following word. He said, he said, he said a number of things. He said, you will teach God's word, you will administer, and you'll have a hand on technology and make it sweet. Was he right? I still have that word. Because when the enemy tells me, you know, you're not to do teach God's word anymore, I go, well, look, God said it, it's happened, and it's working. Interestingly enough, and I'll, I'll cite this as an example, I was responsible for the network, the school net, computer network in the earlier days, in those days when you could be a teacher and run a school network. We had about 150-odd computers on the network. I had a couple of technicians working under me. And it was really fabulous. But then the government changed the definition and somebody said, oh, would you like to become head of department? And I went, yeah, okay. More money. Can I say something? And I will honestly say, guess what? It didn't work. It didn't work as a head of department. So in, the, in fact, what they did was they gave me a sideways move and made me responsible for some more technology. And guess what happened? It worked. I was great, in, I know, I say great in the classroom, I enjoyed my time in the classroom, I trust students learnt, but actually when I became head of department it didn't work, because guess what? That wasn't what God had said, and that wasn't my calling, and I, I was a bit unsure about it at the time, but thought, yeah, let's give it a go. And you see, we need to be those who know our calling. And can I say, if somebody comes and brings, speaks a prophetic word over you, it should be confirmatory, not revelatory. You know, if God's came up to me and said, God's given me this word for you, you'd have pack up your home and go and work in Australia, I'd go, yeah, really? Because God hasn't said anything about Australia to me. He hasn't said anything about leaving the village where we live, but God has said to me about things about what he wants me to do in the village. And that's been confirmed. But you see, if it comes as revelatory, I would say, hang on, Lord, let's park it. Let's put it on the shelf and see if there's anything, see what you've got to say about it. And that is part of judging prophecy. Be very, very aware or very, very careful, I would say this, of people who bring sort of prophetic words over you for which you have no witness, if that makes sense. So let's have a look. What I'm going to say is I'm going to fly through. I put down a whole load of examples and I'm just going to mention them in passing because I don't want to look at them for the sake of time because I want to get on to testing. But if you actually, if, you want to, if you're noting them down, as I said, I will make a PDF version of this available. In Acts 11 and verse 28, there was an example of, there was a word brought, a prophetic word, that there would be a famine and guess what? Well, it didn't change. There was a famine. There was in Acts 21, 11, um, somebody said to Paul, you know, I'm going to bind you with your belts. Did it happen? Yes, it did. In Acts 22, 10, there was another prophetic word given. Um, in Acts 23, 3 and verse 11, two more prophetic word examples. Did they happen? Yes, they did. There was an example of Paul when he was in the ship. And if you remember, he was in, going to be shipwrecked. And there are a number of words that Paul brought to that example in verses 10, 27 and 34. I don't want to spend time on this morning because I want to get on to testing. 
OK, so let's now have a look at testing prophecy, because I felt for us this was the key thing. We all know about prophecy. We're all familiar with prophecy. We're all familiar with words. But let's have a look at the testing. Can I say this is not what you sit in church with your tech checklist and go, it can form, it can form. You, no. But just be aware of the fact that we need to weigh and test things. And can you see here, it says in Acts 11, and verse 27, it said, In those days prophets came from, Ante from Jerusalem to Antioch. Can I say, if you are moving in the prophetic, if God wants you to move in the words of prophecy, get together with others so you can check each other out. It's the same with Nigel mentioned it in ministry. Do not go and minister to somebody on your own. It's not a safe place to be. You need somebody and nothing else guarding your back. And it, but it does say, it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but look, test all things and hold on to the goods. God wants us to test everything. I want you to, you know, at the end of this, by all means, when I, I'll send out the PDF, by all means, go through, email me back if something wasn't right. You know, you said this, you know, I'm quite happy with that. But you see, we need to be testing and, the, and in verse 1 John 4, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. We can see that today. We know we, we are of God. He who knows God hears us, and he who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know that the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Can I say one thing? One of the first things that you will know if somebody brings something that's not wrong, I say, you know in the knower. You will know. There will be something in you that doesn't witness to that being right. It might be a word in a meeting. It might be a reading. It might be a song. But can I say you, when that happens, it cuts across the flow of the Holy Spirit. Recently, I was leading the service in our church. Our pastor was away. And somebody brought a song. Absolutely lovely song. I had nothing wrong with the song. Wrong, right song, wrong time. It absolutely cut across the flow of the Holy Spirit. I was in a quandary. What do I do? Do I get the musicians to go back a song to pick up where we were? Or do we carry on? And can I say... I knew that the person concerned, if we went back, they'd have kicked off big time. I just happened to know this person quite well. They would have said, they would have come at me, they would have come at it in the meeting and said, oh, you, you know, I felt that was of God. I just sensed, in my, so I left it and moved on. But can I say, at least half a dozen people said to me, you know the song that we sang before the one that was brought from the body? We should have gone back to that one. Interestingly, the body knew what was going on. But I also said to them, well, I didn't do it, and I explained the reason. But you see, we will know because it will cut across the flow of what God's doing. So let's have a look, and I've come up with eight tests for testing prophecy. As I said, this is not a checklist for every single word. You know, somebody, I was talking to somebody the other day, and... Uh, um, I have, when I'm packing up our caravan to go, I have a little checklist to make sure I've done everything. Um, I, I started that years ago because, as you, and anybody knows, if you're ever on the Bible week, we, everybody used to come up and say goodbye when we're packing up. That's why it takes us about four hours to pack up. But, I, you know, you get through a few things and you'd forget what you got to. Sadly enough, I've got a checklist on a peg. You know, people come and say, oh, bye-bye, we're off. And I'm thinking, yeah, and I'm halfway taking my awning down. But you see, it's not, can I just say, it's not like that. We don't need to have our laminated card with our checklist for prophecy in the meetings. Do you have consent to my heart? But we do need to be aware of, and here are the eight tests. And let's have a quickly look through them this morning. Firstly, first one, does it build up or does it condemn? Matthew 15, 13, it, Jesus, and, and he said, this is Jesus said, every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. If it's not of God, God will remove it. And sometimes we've had words in church and I've said, Lord, just wipe that out of people's minds. It really wasn't of you. Can I say, you know, you sit in a church meeting and, 
you have somebody brings, uh, brings a word during the praise and worship. Week two, the same person brings a word during the worship. And those first two were right. And what happens week three? They bring a word during the worship and you go, no, nope, not this week. Because it is not, it's vague and it's a bit wishy-washy and it's grey, I'm going to call it. But you see, interestingly enough, I then spoke to somebody afterwards on one particular occasion. Somebody brought something in the, ch in the meeting and I said to somebody, what did you think of that word? And they went, what word? I thought, thank you, Lord. One of the other people, had f they'd already forgotten it. God had just taken it from people's minds. Second test is it must, must agree with Scripture. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction and for instruction in righteousness. And Isaiah 8 verse 19, it says, When they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards and whisper and mutter, you should not, seek the, should not a people seek their God. Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living, to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, because it, it is because there is no light in them. We need to be able to test it against God's word. We need to be able to test it and see whether or not it's of God or whether it's not of God. And if you remember, man has got three parts. Spirit, soul and body. And I quite believe sometimes you can bring something that is not of God, that I can be completely from the wrong spirit. Or just purely, it's soulish. The problem with us as humans is that we are not very good at being silent. You know, you're sat there in a meeting and there's that silent presence of God and then somebody starts to bring what they think is a word and you want to go and kick them and shut them up. Or am I the only one who ever sat in a meeting like that? You see, we need to be... And that what they bring is it, it's sort of wishy-washy and it's a bit scriptury, but actually doesn't really agree with what the scriptures say. And the next one is, what is the prophet or the person who brings it? What is their walk with Jesus like? You see, John 16, 13, it says, When he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you in all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but he will speak what he hears. He will speak, and he will tell you of the things to come. He will glorify me, and he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And in Revelation 19, it says, And at his feet, we fell at his feet to worship, and he said to me, See that you, you do not do that, for I am a fellow servant of your brethren and the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It needs to be, we need to have a look at where is that person? Are they working with, walking with God or are they not walking with God? Because we've seen some interesting stuff brought. If you've only got a scan on the web, we, we can know all sorts of bits and pieces. But let's say, is the person who is bringing it, where are they in their walk with God? And then we goes on and it says, and it, then the next one is, does the prophet and the prophecy bear good fruit? Is there fruit? We know what the fruit of the Spirit are, but if we get a word from God and it is right, one of the immediate things is that it will bring peace. It won't bring strife. It won't bring contention. Galatians 5.22 reminds us that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control against which there is no law. Let's look at what, what does it bring, this word? How does it, how does it bed? And Romans 14 said, For none of us lives to ourselves and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, Whenever we live or die, we are the Lord. So we need to make sure that that is what is bringing good fruit. And Matthew 7.15 says the following, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. So what we can see on the outside might be good, but we need to see what the fruit is inside. You will know them by their fruits. I know one person misquoted that and said you'll know them by their suits. Do men gather grapes or thorn bushes or figs from thistles? God wants us to look at the fruit that is coming 
from the lie, from the person. Number five says, are the predictions true? We looked at this passage the other day, didn't we? I always remember, as I, I'll re-quote again, just for the sake, Johnny Barr, I, I, I quote him quite a lot, you know, he used to say, if you're going to sell prophecies in my church, well, it wasn't his church, but we knew what he meant. If you're going to prophesy in my church, you've got to stick around for five years so we know whether or not to stone you. We joked about it, but actually it's, it's, it's in reality, in Deuteronomy 18, it talks about a prophet who, speak, who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, who speaks in the names of other gods, that prophet shall die. How did they, how did they deal with the, the false prophets? They took them outside the camp and stoned them. Not a pleasant way to go, but, let's put it this way, it brought security to the children of Israel. And that's what it's about. It's not about condemning somebody who brings something, but actually we need to be exhorting them. But if they know full well that this principle is in action, then they're going to be judged. And if they bring a prophetic word, something is going to happen. Then there is security in that. And look what it says in Romans 12. It says, having gifts, gifts differing according to the grace that is given us, let us use them. If it is prophecy, let us prophesy. Look in proportion to our faith. You know, if we're new in the walk with God, then our faith is not maybe as much as somebody who's been walking with the Lord for 30 or 40 years. Or it might be the other way around, actually. But it says we need to prophesy or bring prophetic words or that sort of thing in proportion to our faith. Number six, does it promote obedience to God? Deuteronomy 13, 1, it says, If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder... And the sign of the wonder comes to pass, which he has spoken to you, saying, let us go after other gods. Look, sign of wonders, but look what it's aiming to do. Not leading you to God, but to lead you away from God. Let, saying to you, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or the dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. I believe that when something started to go on in an, in an airport in Canada, I believe that was a test for the church. God was testing us. After all, when news reporters go in and start laughing and rolling on the floor uncontrollably with their camera on a tripod, you know, I believe that was God testing and needed the church actually to say that's not right. Just because that church had been right before doesn't mean to say they would be right then. And I, you know, okay, that's my opinion. It's not a thus saith the Lord. But I think having looked at it at the time and I felt uncomfortable about it at the time. And can I, can I say, and I will, we went to a Bible week in 95 when that was all kicking off big time. And they had invited a speaker from America to come and speak. And the day that he was due to speak, the Malvern Hills caught fire. We sat there on the showground, the three counties showground, and we were sat there with my, my parents were there, they were attending the Bible week with us. And we thought, my dad commented, he said he shouldn't be starting a bonfire. And we watched and we watched as this fire rapidly went up the hills and it went for five miles over the top of the Malvern Hills. And I said, I thought that was a warning. That particular night, this particular preacher spoke. He came and he said, I've come to bring an anointing to the meeting. I've come from America to bring an anointing. And Helen and I think we swapped spaces, didn't we? So I was on the aisle and she was in... And then it kicked off, okay? And I will say this, there were ladies laughing with their arms and their feet in the air with their skirts around their waists. 
We saw it happening at the front. They said that was of God. And interesting, they said, right, we're, we've got people who are now anointed. If you go to the row at the end of the rows down there, and you want you to pass it on. Interestingly enough, we got they started to come down this row, and I went, no, nah, that's not coming here, Lord. And I stood here, and this Chinese-looking lady, who was laughing and screaming away, started to come across the aisle, and I said, no, in Jesus' name. And it looked like she hit a force field. She went, Badoom! and just couldn't get through. She kept trying to get through to me. And as I stood there, and I knew then that was not of God. There were some, there were some appalling things going on. There was, you know, don't, you know, if it's not happening to you, you're resisting the move of God and all the rest. We no longer went back with that particular group to the Bible. We, we did something else the following summer. But can I say, you, you will know what is of God and what isn't of God. And we have to be those, and increasingly in these days, I believe, and I will say this, that I think the enemy is going to try and do that again in the church. It's, things are going to get tough, but I think there's, there's going to be a true revival and there's going to be a false revival. That's not in my notes, by the way. But I say that. Let's be those, and if I'm not, look, if it doesn't happen, I'm quite happy to say I was wrong, but I believe that quite strongly. And in Acts 16, we've mentioned this, and it says, Now it happened as they went to prayer, a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us, had brought the masters much profit by fortune telling, and the followed Paul and cried out, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. What she was saying was right, but the spirit behind it was wrong. And as we know, Paul dealt with it. Last couple, it says, does it bring us freedom and peace? Romans 8 says, it does not, you did not receive a spirit to the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption who cried out, Abba, Father. Can I say, the meeting that I'm referring to, we must have left, we walked out at about 10 o'clock. And they were still at it till 3 or 4 in the morning, and next morning people walking around like zombies. That's not the God I know, because my God knows I need to... I mean, if God moves supernaturally, look, I don't, don't get me wrong, we can stay up all night if the Holy Spirit is genuinely moving, but you won't be a wreck in the morning. Does that make sense? The fruit of it is that if God wants us to be up all night praying for the nation, he will provide us with supernatural strength to do so. I know that um, I go back, and I'm just reminded of the fact that when Helen was, so, was ill in hospital, a group from our church prayed all night while she was undergoing six hours of brain surgery. Two of the guys from the church at two in the morning packed up sandwiches and coffee and brought myself and my son's food to the John Radcliffe Hospital from Reading. Okay? And I don't drink coffee, so I had the my sons and I had the cheese rolls and they had the coffee. But the interesting thing was they were with me till about half past three in the morning and then went back to Reading and both the two guys concerned went to work next day and they said they didn't feel like they'd been up all night. That was the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit to maintain them. You know what I'm saying? If God moves, let's go with it. But let's make sure it's of God. And number seven, have we got number seven? Does it bring freedom and peace? You did not receive the spirit of bondage. We've read that one. In 1 Timothy 2 verse 7 it says, For God not, has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. You know, as I said, and the last one, it said, does it feel right? I don't like to put that in, but I put it in because it's actually true. As I said, you will know in your knower, that's probably one of the first checks. You'll know whether it's right, whether that prophetic word is right. 1 John 2, 27, it says, But the anointing which you have received let, uh, from him abides in you. You do not need anyone to teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. What can teach us so that we know what it is we need to know? And therefore, we will have that witness. You know, and... As I said, if something is not right, there will be people around you moving in the Holy Spirit who you can turn to and say, I'm not sure about that. 
Going back to the example where we had the song, right song, wrong time. I firmly believe that actually had I done what I maybe I should have done when I was leading that meeting, God would have intervened and I would have had the witness and but I just knew the person concerned and how they might have sort of responded. So let's be those who judge. But let's, as we, as we start to sort of come down the hill, let's just look at one more thing this morning. So we've looked at prophecy, and I just want to look at, and I felt prompted this morning to look at faith. Because I think we're going to have tough times when our faith is going to be tested. You see, it says faith is the supernatural ability to believe God without human doubt, unbelief or reasoning. And look how faith comes. It says come, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I was, I was greatly challenged by something Nigel talked about. I, when I read, read God's word, I tend to read it silently. One of the things, one of the takeaways from this week is I'm going to start reading it out loud more often. As I, used to say, as I used to say when I was teaching to all of my classes, I said, make sure you have one takeaway from today's lesson. And I would exhort you to see, is there one thing that God, God wants to change in our lives as a result of these few days we've been together? There might be more things. But I would challenge you to bet, what is your takeaway? And it says in Romans 10... 17 it says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God in Ephesians 2 verse 8 it says for grace you have been saved through faith that not of ourselves it is the true gift of God not works lest anyone should boast and in Romans 12 it says it says through grace given to me everyone is among you not that you think of yourself more highly than the ought but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith God will give us the faith we need in particular circumstances and certain times. We're sitting here today. Did any of you see this barn go up? I don't know how long it's been here, but we are certainly trust, we have faith in those who built it that the roof will stay up. I jokingly say, I jokingly say to the pupils at school, they say to me, they said, oh, we don't have faith, we don't believe in anything. I said, well, you sat in this building... I said, did you ever see it go up? They went, nope. I said, well, I did. I saw the steelwork go up. This is one of the new blocks we have, which is where I'm based. I said, I saw the steelwork up. I saw the concrete go in. I saw the plans, because I was helping guide them on the putting in of the IT systems. I said, I trust that they've got it right. I said, otherwise, you better be sitting out in the field. Because oh, we don't have faith. I said, yes, you do. You've got f- nothing else. You've got faith in the architects to get this building right. There's one thing they didn't quite get right. And I'm Helen Steinemann. There was one particular staff toilet that if you went in a break and then a year group moved in upstairs, so that would be 240 students upstairs, the building moved sufficiently to wedge the door shut. They didn't get that quite right. Well, if you imagine 250 teenagers moving into 20-something old classrooms on the up floor, that's quite a loading. That was the one thing they didn't quite get right. In the middle, there's a staff toilet. and you... Let me put it this way, and, I, and I, you, know, you can see the gap changing as the, as, as the students come in. I've actually, sadly, as a physics teacher, on one occasion, I actually stood outside and watched the gap in the door get smaller and smaller and smaller. But the building hasn't collapsed. And I say to students, you know, they had faith in the architect. They didn't quite get that bit right. But you see, we have to have faith in God, not faith in faith. And in Romans 11, in Hebrews 11, 6, it says the following. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please him who comes to God and must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If we diligently seek God, if we say, Lord, Lord, I'm I'm really trusting you on this, he will meet us more than halfway. And that's important, that if we have faith and we trust God and we do the things he has told us to do, and I say make sure it is, then he will reward those who diligently seek. And Jesus said, because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here 
to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. However, it is the kind that does not go out except by prayer and fast. He was talking about the deliverance. And he was talking to the disciples because they said, we can't do it. And Jesus said, you know, you need to make sure you have faith and you are hearing from me. And I'm going to skip to, and I'm going to go to Hebrews 11. Nope, it didn't go to. There we go. Hebrews 11, 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, verse 3 says, We understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are were seen and which were not seen not made of things which are invisible. And verse 6 says, Without faith is it impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hebrews, I quoted this verse to a gentleman who was flying the air ambulance when it landed outside our house. Um, a few weeks ago, was it one Sunday afternoon, Helen slept through it. I don't know how she managed. You know, when the air ambulance comes over our house, they came over at about 150 feet. I mean, and that thing's quite noisy. And I went out there and I got... There were lots and lots of kids around who all wanted to get too close and the guy was a bit concerned that these teenagers... Because, of course, if anybody touches the air ambulance, they have to ground it. That's why they sort of say, please don't come any close. So I, was, I said to the guy, do you want a hand? Well, I made him a cup of tea first. Um, and then I was, but you see, I was talking to this guy, I got talking to him, found out he's a Christian, you see. And he turned around and he said to me, he said, oh, oh, do you believe in the Genesis 1 stuff? I'm thinking, how can you be a Christian and not believe the Genesis 1 stuff, as he put it? And I said to him, I said, well, just look around. I said, how can you not believe that God created this when you just look at it and the complexities of it? And I said to him, I turned around and said to him, I said, you fly this, you know, four and a half tons of helicopter. I said, have you ever met the person who built it? And he went, no. And I said, this helicopter, I said, I'm a, I said to him, I'm a physics teacher. I said, I've taught IT. I said, I know that this is minusculely complex compared with the human body. I said, yeah, you're flying a helicopter with doctors in who will attempt to fix. And I said, have you got any idea how to fix this? And he went, no. And I said, but how can you believe that this works if you don't believe that this, you know, this was created by God? Because, you know, it doesn't just happen by chance. And we ended up with this quite interesting discussion about Genesis chapter 1. But I said to him, I said, look, I said, you know, God, God you know, you need to listen to what God is saying. Because I said, you'll need it in the days that lie ahead. And I think that was the point at which I went to make him the cup of tea. Because he came back and said, I've been, he said, I will say one thing about this. He said, this call hasn't happened by chance for me. I thought, thank you, Lord. But you see, I'm not quite sure where he was on the faith scale, but he'd certainly missed out the first three chapters of the Bible. And I said to him, look, if you don't believe the first three chapters, why don't you just rip them out? Take a pen, take a knife and cut them out of the Bible. And I said, then cut out all the references that Jesus made to it. And talking to the guy, and he then turned around and he said to me, he said, hmm, you've challenged me today. That wasn't what I was planning for a Sunday afternoon and an air ambulance trip. And I said, well, maybe we've had a divine encounter. Um, and actually at that point, I, interestingly enough, a whole group of lads came across the field on their bikes. I thought, they're not of God. And he sort of asked, we had to sort of keep them at bay. But you see, we need to have faith, and the Bible talks about us having faith even in the things we haven't seen. And the more I get to understand, if nothing else, about the human body, about the immune system, I've done quite a lot of research into the immune system recently, the more I realise I don't understand and how, my fut how our futile brains cannot comprehend how it works. But you see, we need to have faith in God. Um, in 1 Kings 17, and we are nearly there, and I'm probably going to finish a bit early, but there we go. In 1 Kings 17, we find... Uh, I, I, 
Elijah and Elisha have spoken to me greatly over the last uh, few months. But let's read what it says. It said, Elijah the Tishbite, the inhabitants of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord of God lives, whom, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, except on my word. And verse 7, it said, It happened after a while that, after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. God was judging things. If you read the whole thing from 16 through to 19, it's all about God dealing with things that weren't right in the land. Um, and I love the fact that it says, I think it's in 1 Kings 16, where Elijah was referred to by Ahab as a troubler in the land. And I want to say that if... I just sort of said to the Lord, the Lord really spoke to me about that, and I, I really felt that if we are going to be trouble in this land, I at least want to have some of Elijah's anointing. I don't care if people call me trouble anymore, because if they call me trouble, then I want some of Elijah's anointing, because that's what God's Word said. That's just for me. But maybe for you. And when your neighbours call you trouble, say, Lord, let me have some of Elijah's anointings for some miraculous stuff to go on here. After all, I mean, he did see some amazing things happen. And then we jump on to chapter 18, and it said, It came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year. It hadn't rained for three years, and we're complaining. When, when did it? Well, it rained the other day, didn't it? But we haven't had serious rain in this country. America is experiencing the same. Although, interestingly enough, in some states, they're saying rain on one side of the highway and no rain on the other. I follow some Christians on YouTube who are farmers. If I say, if I told you it takes them an hour to drive from one end of the two farms to the other, that'll give you a size of the size of the farms. These are not small farms. Interestingly enough, it's rained on their farms. These are two Christian farms, but it hasn't rained the other side of the highway. Isn't that interesting? They did actually say on one of the YouTube, the, there's a young girl who, she's the, it's her YouTube channel, and she did, did mention right at the very end, she said, please pray for us farmers that we'll have some rain. Because, because they do a lot by irrigation, and the irrigation had dropped to the point where they were going to have to extend the wells. But it rains, and rains, and rains. No hail, but it rains. Because they said often with heavy rain they get hail, and of course that will destroy the crops. But look what it says here, and it says, I'll just read it again. It says, came to pass men, after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. And it came to pass the seventh time that he said, this was his servant, didn't he, in verse 44. If you remember, he sent his servant away, kept sending his servant away. And when his servant said, there is a cloud as small as a man's hand riding out of the sea. So he said, go up and say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops. That is faith. She saw the cloud and he said, right, now it's going to rain. And he was somebody who, A, brought the prophetic words in faith, and B, when he saw the outcome. Let's have a couple more. In Luke chapter 7, we find Jesus. No, nope, it didn't. I think I need some new batteries. Luke chapter 7 and verse 12, it says, And when he came near the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, as she was a widow. And a large crowd from the city was with her, and the Lord saw her, and he had compassion on her, and said, Do not weep. And he came and touched the open coffin, and to those who carried him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. So he was dead, sat up, and began to speak, and he presented him to his mother. You see, Jesus could have done anything. But he moved, knowing that God was, his father was going to move in this particular case. And look what happened as a result. Did they all bow down and worship Jesus? No, but the fear came upon them all and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen up among us and God has visited his people. And this report went about him throughout all Judea and the surrounding region. You see, he spoke and it happened and we saw a miracle. And let's just look at one more example. In Acts chapter 9, and I think we're going to have to see this, and it says, Then Peter arose and went with them. And when he'd come, he brought him to the upper room, and all the windows stood by him weeping, showing their tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter 
put them out and knelt down and prayed and turning to the body he said Tabitha arise and she opened her eyes and when she saw Peter she sat, sat up he had the faith knew God was moving and by faith he spoke and she arose and then he gave her his hand and lifted her up and when he had called the saints and the widows and presented her alive and became known throughout all of Joppa and many look at the fruit of it and this is the important thing when we move in faith there will be fruit either in our lives or in the people around us. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed on the Lord. When we move in faith, God will meet us halfway. In fact, probably more than halfway. If we are doing something in faith because our hearts are wanting Him to be glorified, he will answer and move. If we've got the wrong motives, God won't do it. And I think that's important. So in the days which lie ahead, we're going to need to see God's miraculous provision. We're going to see, need to see the Lord heal. We're going to, you know, with those of us who know that you've got, let's put it this way, what's it, a six-week waiting list to see the doctor? You know, maybe we just need to sort of lay hands on ourselves, get somebody to lay hands on us and say, Lord... I need your healing in this. Can I say, and I'm just going to mention very briefly tongues and interpretation because I haven't got long, I've got one sentence. If you bring a tongue in a meeting, one of the things I say to you is you need to have the faith to bring the interpretation. I won't say, I don't think we need any more than that on tongues and interpretations in meetings. Feel free to move in the Holy Spirit, but be prepared to bring the interpretation yourself. It's all by faith and the power of the Holy Spirit, all that we do. And all I would just want to leave with us as we come to the end of what I was sharing is that make sure we're full of the Holy Spirit on a daily basis. If nothing else, if you want to take away, take away and say, Lord, you know, wherever you have that, you know, wherever your quiet time is, or whether God speaks to you, God speaks to me in two places. Number one is when I'm walking the dogs and number two when I'm in the shower. Anybody else have God speak to them in the shower? Maybe it's because there's no other distractions. But I'm serious, wherever your place is with God, you know, it might, might be in the sofa, in, in, you know, with a, a, is it Charles Wesley's mother who used to, you know, she had her prayer closet was with a towel over her head and the family knew that was her prayer time. You know, we need to know the refilling of the Holy Spirit. Know where our re recharge station is, that we might be those who move on with God. And just finally, one or two people have said to me, well, you haven't done all of these. I said, well, no, but if you actually, I have actually covered, I'll be honest, this is not the first time I've delivered this lot. The rest, all the other bits that we haven't had a chance to look at, you can find on YouTube. If you look me up on YouTube, you'll find them there where I've done them in full detail. Let's just pray. Father, as we come to the end of what I felt you'd asked me to share about tools in the toolbox, Father, there are many tools we haven't looked at. But Father, you know they're there. And you can instruct us on how to use them when it comes to that point in time. Father, may we, number one, be a people who go from this place and go from this week overflowing with the power of the Holy Spirit. That, Father, we will know and just be able to use the tools that you have equipped us with when we need words of wisdom and when we need knowledge, when we need to move in faith, when we need to be discerning what's going on, when we need healing and we need miracles. Father, may we be a people who can testify that you have equipped us for that which we need. And I'm reminded of that verse as we finally end, and it said, eagerly desire the best gifts. The best gift is the gift we need in that circumstances and situation now. Father, we just say thank you for what you are going to do in our lives. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, I would just pray, if there's anything of me that wasn't right, then Father, we just pray you will just take it from whoever's listening, either now or on YouTube, take it from their minds that may only see Jesus in all of this and we pray now in Jesus name Amen, Amen. Thanks Mike, I've just got a couple of uh, uh, announcements um, 
It's Mike and Helen's wedding anniversary today. Aww. Praise the Lord. We've got a little something for you both. Helen, come on forward. Let's pray for you. And uh, I've got two ice packs belonging to somebody here. They're yours. There they are. Okay, and I've got two copies left of Pearl Coleman. Pearl Coleman, who spoke to us last night, they're complimentary. If you like them, come and help yourselves. And uh, amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Father, we, we, we thank you, Lord, for uh, Mike and Helen, Lord, yes, and the family. And we, we thank you, Father, for the, uh, the, the work they put into your kingdom, yes. O oh God, over the years, Lord, yes, in these Lord. camps. And we, we pray you'd bless them this day. We thank you for the miracle that she's standing here yes. mm. at all, O oh God. And we Amen. pray that healing Amen. continue, yes. Father God, that you restore her energies to her, Lord. Yes, mm. Lord. And uh, we just thank you that uh, you bless them, Father, going out and coming in. In the mighty name of Jesus, may there be many more years together ahead of them, Father God. And may they bear much fruit, 30, 60, even 100 fold, mm, in amen. the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. amen. Father, amen. we just pray your blessing on this book that's been written, Father. And I pray that it will be a blessing to others in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. amen. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 10 years here or there. Now, seeing as Stephen, Timothy's 26 this year, so. Uh, no, 20, 36 years. So, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I think for the last how many years we've had our wedding anniversary at Bible Week, so. Uh, yes. Right, tea and coffee. Pastor Greg's coming to speak to us in half an hour.